Kodo mo meme o pit money. Hinge it oi a choy umpa. Hinge it oi will be. That is how it was then in the beginning. All the earth was covered with water. Darkness was everywhere. I know my dum has seek him at. Has seen my at. Kai no ye men choy umpa. Amunikan unin kodom che wusuk dipem. Then one day, coming along one day, Turtle came, came along swimming in the water. Then down from the sky, down from above, came he who began all things, he, Earthmaker. And he was bright, very bright. He shone like the sun. Brother, said Turtle, brother, can't you make me some nice dry land so I can come up out of the water sometime? And so Earthmaker sent Turtle down to get some mud, to dive down deep to get some mud from the bottom. And then Turtle said, Brother, I cannot stay in the dark all the time. Can't you make a light so I can see? And Earthmaker said, Look that way. Look to the east. I'm going to tell my sister to come up. Hell. How do you like it, said Earthmaker. It's very good, said Turtle. Is that all you're going to do? And Earthmaker said, no. I'm going to do more yet. And then he made a tree. A tree with 12 kinds of acorns. With all the acorns growing on it. Amunikan unin kodom che wusuk dipem, kodom yu chono choy am. Hepinin koyoidi, kodo che he he chono pem, yak hibit choy am. Kodom kan, washa hibit choy am. This is the world that Earthmaker and Turtle saw. It is still here in the Sacramento Valley of Northern California. But the people who told the stories of its creation are gone. The Wintun, the Atsugewi, the Akomawi, the Yana, the Miwok, and the Maidu. All are gone. questions that we as archaeologists seek answers to, uh, questions about culture and, and changes in cultural system or evolution of man's behavior. There is such a thing as a discipline of anthropological archaeology, which is generating theories and methods which are new, which are innovative, and in some ways which are, let's say, uh, much more promising than those coming from other kinds of social science. The questions that these archaeologists are asking are based on contemporary anthropological theory about man and time. How do societies exist, change, and adjust to changing environments? Why do they sometimes fail to adjust and survive? Over here, over on the foothills, is all an acorn utilizing belt, and the only artifacts you get are grinding stone here on the river to get among the Maidu here. Well, the Maidu would be down this film is about one group of anthropologists working with one culture within a particular span of time. They have chosen to limit their investigation to the Maidu Indians of Northern California, who last inhabited the Sacramento Valley in the late 19th century. They know that there were changes in the Maidu culture. Their goal is to determine how, and perhaps why, these changes took place through time. Ecology, history, geography, ethnography. 
The archaeologist must become thoroughly familiar with the world as the Maidu and others of the time experienced it. October 1849. Am nächsten Tage entschlossen wir uns deshalb die nördliche Welt 1849. On this day we came to the first Indian village built on the banks of the river and consisting of at least 30 or 35 well-made huts dug half in the ground and walled and roofed very much like those of the Mandan Indians of North America. The huts were dug about four feet deep into the ground, strong posts being set up in the inside and in the middle, with rafters and beams across them, which were overlaid and connected with branches and finally covered with a thick and well-beaten coat of earth, which was of a perfectly round shape and turned off the rain completely. Above ground, those rose to a height of six or eight feet, having a small and low entry. Is that we're simply not supplementing historic evidence or, or ethnographic accounts. We're actually using historic evidence and ethnographic accounts to supplement archaeologically generated theories about evolution of California Indians, among other things. The archaeologists go out to look at the world that they have until now known only through written accounts and previously gathered data. They will learn to work and think in different dimensions of time. I think that the, the local Maidu had a rather civilized approach to this damn yellow stuff. It wasn't worth anything. You can't make a fish hook out of it. You know. uh, what can you do with it? And they hadn't gotten around to filling teeth. Weekly Current, June 17, 1871, Butte Creek Mines. These mines have been doing well this season, yielding from $15 to $25 per day. The scarcity of water has been a great drawback. But the Cherokee Company commenced piping in their claims. They have an ample supply of water and are washing down the side of the hill with great rapidity. If you can swap a day's labor for some cloth or a, a hatchet or an iron knife, uh, you have something of value. But what good is this yellow stuff, you know? What, what is this passion that these bearded characters have? Mr. Harris has gone below with a large sack, apparently enough to buy half of San Francisco or Chico. When the water improvements of Cherokee are completed, there will be nothing in the way to prevent her miners from getting rich. Field research continues. The world of the Maidu begins to take form the questions which should be asked about it become clearer. The impressive nature of the introduced things is obvious. The downfall of the original vegetation is a little hazier. 
too, uh, it has too many crystals in it. When you uh, try to uh, chip these into into forms, they would they would probably break unevenly. Whereas 50. And we noted in our aerial reconnaissance that almost all the hilltops in the basin show a different soil color than the surrounding gullies. And this appears to be due to... We have to another kind of site, which is a deep midden, which may or may not have house pits on it. The first owners of the first one was uh, Squire Wright, mm -hmm. and uh, he was my grandmother's brother. He settled in about 1849, and then he came to California in 1849, and then they got a hotel over here on the creek in about 1850. I don't remember knowing any of this when I was a little kid. My dad did when uh, he knew him. I mean, when he was living, he said there was about 200 Indians down at the ranch. We found a lot of uh, shaft straighteners and uh, mortars and pestles and just loads and loads all the time. It was there before they moved away. Mm -hmm. But since I was born, there's never been any Indians around there, and I never knew any of them that, that had been there. Gradually, the scope of their research narrows. Attention is focused on a large village site which appears to be representative of Maidu culture as it may have existed from A.D. 1500 to the end of the 19th century. Four Butte One. Four, the number given to the state of California. Butte, the county name. And one, indicating that it was the first site recorded in the county. It is here that the archaeologists will attempt to find answers to their questions about the Maidu. six weeks, their world will be a small patch of land which may or may not yield data that will answer questions about a now extinct tribe. Perhaps more important for student and archaeologist alike, 4 Butte 1 will offer a chance to test, to reject, to learn. When a modern archaeologist goes to an archaeological site. He doesn't view the site as simply a mine out of which he gets things. He views the site as a laboratory in which he's going to carry on an experiment. I think that's what I'm quite a bit. And they're bulldozing and they cut down all this land out there and filled in the slough. The soil rises or dips. You look for indications of uh, bulldozers and so forth. And what you will probably come up with a lot more questions than you'll ever come up with answers. But never, once you start working in this area, never forget to realize that you're still in a, in a, in a larger world <clears throat> when you're driving home in the truck. How long was Four Butte One inhabited? Where were village activities carried out and by whom? Okay. What did the houses of the Maidu look like? The study of artifacts and the relationships between artifacts may provide some of the information needed to answer these questions. Preliminary clearing and measuring of the site begins. The archaeologists are here to gather data. They must precisely record the detailed location or provenience of each object found at the site. Straighten it up. Straighten it up. Right, right we keep track of the absolute elevation with respect to that concrete marker. And we obviously do that with the uh, stadia rod and transit there. We also keep track of what we call arbitrary levels. The first units that I took out would always be level one, irregardless of whether it was high on a hill or, or uh, low in a valley. You start counting from the top, and that's level one. Four obsidian flakes, 
90 pieces freshwater clam shell, two iron nails, 26 fragments small mammal bone, eight shell beads, one obsidian core, two olivella side lopped beads, five square nails, one deer pelvis burnt, four ground stone fragments. July 10, we covered two pestles, three beads, one projectile point, 30 pieces of bone. One Jim said we should look out for unusual pieces. Three shotgun shells. Five pieces worked bone. Level two. Found four clamshell disc beads. Also a piece of shell shaped like an arrowhead. But Don said they didn't make them out of shell. 90 pieces freshwater clamshell. Two iron nails. 26 fragments small mammal bone. July 10th. Found two pestles, three bone awls, 20 basalt flakes today. Had to throw out a lot of things I thought were artifacts, but weren't. One horseshoe, two mortar fragments, 15 glass fragments. The large rock, pedestaled in area two, turned out to be a mortar with one hole. We made a drawing, measured it, took a depth measurement, and removed it to the laboratory. One pestle fragment, 50 pieces freshwater shell, one possible charm stone. It's very difficult for a student. It's like an antiquarian, to distinguish between discovering things and interpreting things. That is, just because it's an experiment, that doesn't mean that you rule out discovery, but you don't go there simply to discover things. You're reconstructing something. And it involves both elements of discovery from the standpoint of discovering relationships between things which are not necessarily always very obvious. You have to uh, collect data in a certain way so that Subsequent analysis will uh, allow you to perceive kinds of relationships that maybe you can't immediately see when you're in the field. and this is just for sampling, you'll understand this later. If you're starting out a new level and it's level with the ground, in other words, it's already been excavated several levels and it starts out at a level and it goes down a full half a foot, you write complete level, right? This clues us in to look for other bags <laughs> from other days, perhaps, that would have artifacts from the same level in it. Then, when you're done that level, write, st get out of the pit and write some notes. Now, it may be that you didn't find a damn thing. You just say, didn't find a damn thing. <laughs> but if you found something, you can make comments to yourself. You don't, I'm not expecting a list of artifacts that you found. I, won't, I found two and a half projectile points and so forth. What I'm expecting is uh, you want to build up some sort of a comparative memory and, and say, well, we found a lot of this compared with yesterday or a little of this compared with yesterday or a lot of, say, a lot of bone was turning up in the pit. And this is just a matter of experience. You'll learn through time what you have to put in there. field laboratory. Artifacts are brought here each day for the preliminary processing that is the beginning of formal archaeological classification. One of the big changes here between antiquarian interests and modern anthropological interests in, in archaeological remains is that as a modern archaeologist, mm -hmm. I'm primarily interested in the systematic relationships that are preserved for us in the archaeological record between things. I'm interested in the organization which is manifest in archaeological remains. And this is what all of my data collecting techniques and my complicated uh, analysis is aimed at both discovering 
uh, uh, order in the archaeological record and revealing relationships between uh, products of man's activity and byproducts of his behavior. The national ornaments seem to be of very simple kind. They all had both men and women, their ears pierced, and wore in these a simple piece of wood or quill ornament and painted. You're always bouncing back and forth like a yo-yo between these two poles. Of, of working experimentally, orienting yourself in terms of some kind of problems, but at the same time trying to maintain as much, as many nerve endings as you can to, to the possibilities of, of new things and variations. When people live on the surface of the earth, they tend to modify the natural chemistry of the soil. And they do this by discarding waste products. And many of the chemical compounds remain mixed with the soil. With time and abandonment of the site, the chemically altered soil becomes buried. When the archaeologist digs into the site, he uncovers chemically altered soil. So the concept of hydrogen ions You simply can't be an objective machine that gets all the facts. Because the, the facts themselves have to be defined in terms of, of, of your problem. And so you try to maintain as much flexibility as you can. But invariably, it's, it's just like any man going out and studying a tribe. He comes home and he analyzes his information. He finds, well, there are certain kinds of things I should have tried to find out, and I, and I didn't. Well, it's always more serious uh, when you do this in archaeology because you've destroyed the site. And you've act actually, by getting some kinds of data, you've probably destroyed the other kinds. fewer core tools in Area 5 than in Area 1, but a lot more bone. Could this be an area of bone tool manufacture, or was it just a trash dump for garbage? August 6th. We're getting deeper and beginning to find burnt orange clay and small ash lenses in the soil, but we're not sure of their significance yet. charcoal scattered through some of the uh, clay stuff. And there's been an increase in grinding stones in the northwest area on the northwest side and a decrease of chipping waste. This may be an area of woman's work. August 14th. We're finding quite large charcoal fragments with burnt clay. This may be an indication of roof covering and beams.
there, well, there's sort of a, a split personality that, that any really sophisticated archaeologist has, in that he has to have the sophistication and flexibility, that, but at the same time, he has to meet a payroll. That is, there are always practical, practical limitations to what he can do. And this plays an enormously important role in that it is impossible to objectively get all the different kinds of data that are available. We're beginning to uncover burnt house posts. We have to work carefully because we don't know how the posts are laid out yet and we might cut through one or miss one. We spent two hours today putting preservative on house post. We're gonna try to take it out whole. We've come down on the center of the house and are following the floor out to the rim. The floor is fragile, so we work barefoot. They're basically the same. There are posts around the edge, sometimes one in the center, and a central fire pit with one or more mortars near it. We found that the floor is more compact near the center of the house. It appears that most indoor activities were carried on here. We're beginning to see the saucer shape of the house and the pattern of the posts. The floor around the house is very well defined. Okay. Do you think that's all the same floor there from here over to there? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Same level. Same floor. I don't know really where it goes. There's a lot of posts in there. Yeah, there's a good post right down there. Mm -hmm. Two of them, huh? Is that another one? Well, that's a good one. That's this one you can't see. This one's wild. Yeah. Is it real? Yeah. Chief come up there and asked my grandmother to come down to the celebration down to the big sweat house. They went down there and went in the sweat house to, to see the celebration. And when they got there, well, the Indians all got, they had a bonfire in the middle of this, this uh, dance hall. And it was dark in there and smoky, and uh, a whole lot of the Indians lined up all around the wall. And they brought them in there and set them down, my grandmother. And the, the remnant of the tribe of Indians, which some years ago numbered 2,000 souls, were removed a few days ago by Colonel Henley to the Nome Lackey Reservation. The first manifested a great unwillingness to be removed from their old stamping ground, and it was only on the adoption of decisive measures that their removal effected. After finding that they would be compelled to abandon their rancheria, they determined to destroy it in toto even to their acorns that had been garnered for the winter. These, the colonel suggested, should be left for those who remained behind. They objected and would not be satisfied unless they destroyed them. He then offered to purchase them and give them blankets in payment. They assented to the arrangement, but occasionally during the night they would steal away, and presently the mounting flame would note the destruction of a lodge, till all were in ashes. The summer at Four Butte One is reaching its end. Okay, that's five, six, Final measuring, recording, and removing of artifacts takes place. What about the far corner? The individual units of excavation are looked at in the framework of the whole site. Just as the site will be regarded as only a part of the total Maidu culture, and that culture, in turn, is part of a larger natural system. The data has been collected. The archaeologist must now attempt to understand the fragments he has gathered as part of a system that tried to maintain a particular balance. And when that balance was upset beyond regulation, died. 
Four Butte One may provide some information as to the nature of culture and cultural systems. But quite possibly it will also raise new questions that archaeologists must seek to answer at another time, another place.